What is up, everybody? Welcome into episode 11 of Chris and Company. I am Chris Castellani. Okay, <laughs> I'm laughing right now because I-, I recorded the Brandon Walker and the Max Clark interviews several hours apart from each other. So this was these were recorded on the same day. I don't wear the same blue Under Armour shirt all the time. I know people have been accusing me of that with my hoodies in the past. I am a, a, a blue hoodie connoisseur, but no, I do I do change clothes on occasion, but these particular uh, episodes were recorded uh, on the same day. Didn't feel a need to change. I'm about to go for a run, but that's all that's irrelevant. We are going to get to our interview with Tigers prospect Max Clark here in just a second. Uh, Tigers prospect and internet sensation. I, I mean, I'm like, I'm not going to like, you know, try to get some of his followers, but if he wants to throw me a line, like, you know, I mean, 66,000 on Twitter is cool, but 383k. That's that's a lot cooler. That's what he's he's rocking on on the on the grom as uh, as as the kids say Instagram. Okay. Uh, before we do that though, make sure you hit that like button if you're watching this on Rumble or YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Let's get those watch hours up. Make sure to promote, spread the word, comment on who you want me to interview next. In the description for this video is the link tree where you will find literally every possible link to where you can find Chris and company. You know, if you want to, here's the thing. If you want to watch Chris and company on YouTube while listening to it on Apple podcasts or Spotify, you can, it's America. We can indulge. And I, I look forward to you indulging and, and listening and watching Chris and company from now until the end of time. All right. That's, that should do it for the intro. Let's get to our interview. Max Clark. All right, Chris and Company, episode 11. We're joined today by number three overall pick in the 2023 draft, Gatorade National Player of the Year, future Detroit Tiger, and uh, I would say internet sensation at this point. That is Max Clark. Max, welcome to the program. What's up, buddy? What's going on, man? I appreciate you having me on. Like I said, like we've texted, you know, I'm super excited to do this, and, you know, it'd be a good way to connect with Detroit. For sure, man. Well, thank you for doing it. Uh, where are you at right now? Where are you located? Uh, I'm in Lakeland, so I've been down here since uh, early January. Got down here for some early work um, and just kind of get used to the weather. And besides, Indiana was brutal this winter. So I've yeah. been down here since January and now just hanging out at the dorms. Have you been told where you're going to be starting the season? I have not yet. Um, all I know is like the work group I'm put in. Um, and then we'll see. Like I- I'm around a lot of the guys that I was with last year. Uh, so my guess personally is to I'll probably start in Lakeland. Uh, but, you know, try to hit my way out of there fast and uh, get to get GR. Fantastic, man. Well, let's uh, let's I, I'm fascinated kind of by your story here, uh, and, you know, in terms of the, the following you've gathered. And we'll talk about that in a second. But obviously you originally were a commitment to Vanderbilt, which has become a, you know, a baseball factory over the last like decade plus. I mean, just like MLB player after MLB player, top pick. They've got multiple national championships. You know, at what point? kind of during your process, did you realize that you would probably be going directly to the pros? You know, that's honestly a great question because I like, I've thought about this a couple of times now. Um, and like, I've talked about it a few times, um, but like looking back, um, my, my idea was always to go to college. Um, and that was pretty much carrying into my junior year. Um, like I was pretty heavy set on going to college, getting an education. Um, my mother was a school teacher and then my sister and brother both graduated and um, went through with their jobs. So, like, I was very, very education first. Um, and then after my junior year, heading into junior summer, things got pretty surreal. Um, obviously, by then, I had an advisor um, that I'm still with now. and now, He's now my agent. So, like, he had been giving me the different rundowns on what, what we could expect this coming summer, what things might look like. Um, and at the time, I was the number one player in the country um, and stuck with that through the end of high school. So, like, moving forward from, you know, July of – 2022 my my junior year we went through all of the draft process uh excuse me the draft process with uh area codes perfect game usa all of the above and it was just like i kept performing at these events um and then carrying over into my senior winter um i had a bunch of teams showing up in my house i actually had 30 teams in 30 days so 
that I would say like in between my junior and senior year in that summer, like closer to August was when I really like realized this is a, this is a true shot as long as I go ahead and perform in, um, in the spring. You know, man, I, I, again, your, your following's pretty incredible. 383,000 followers on Instagram right now. I was watching a video where I believe it was, it was your dad who said you are in the top 5% of all baseball players in terms of following on social media right now. Uh, you know, you're what are you, are you 18 or 19 years old? Right? Just turned 19, 19 in December. You just turned 19. Was this following that you've garnered, was this a, an intentional decision to try to, to try to gain uh, a following on social media or did, was this more of a, a happy accident? Uh, I would actually say it's both. It started out as kind of just like a happy accident. Um, like my sophomore year was when I really took off on Instagram. Um, I had a friend who came down and shot a, a video where I was uh, playing at Victory Field, which is the AAA for Pittsburgh. And that's like 20 minutes from my house. So our high school team was playing there. Um, I ended up going crazy. I hit like three or four doubles. Um, and he made like a bunch of different TikTok clips of like the entire game. And he posted six total videos and every single one did over a million views. Um, so like literally overnight, I gained a hundred plus on uh, TikTok and then 60 on Instagram. So like between those two, I had hit a point where it was like constantly each and every day that I posted or had new content, I it kind of seemed to just gain, gain, gain. And so in that, like in that aspect, I then turned it to a like intentional thing. You know, what well, actually I was lucky enough to have one of my best friends who does multimedia for a job. Um, so high school, summer ball, he was always there. Um, and it kind of helped me build a brand and it's like branding doesn't always like, or doesn't, excuse me, doesn't only help with, you know, actual brands, getting marketing deals, endorsement deals, NIL, et cetera. But it's also a brand of the fans, like, um, little kids, Detroit fans. Now what at the time, Max Clark fans, like all of the above, it was something that allowed me to, you know, relate with them that allowed me to connect with them and then kind of indulge in them. And, you know, some kids had a role model in their life now because they could follow, you know, X on Twitter or uh, Instagram, whatever it may be. Um, so like I used it for that. Um, but I also used it for the marketing side as well. What was kind of your, your coaches and teammates reactions to it as you were you know going through the high school season, the last few years there? Honestly, my coaches loved it and same with the players. Um, cause like they were also getting stuff out of it. Like they always had pictures in their DMs. They always had videos, like they were a part of the YouTube videos, but it also was like, it was just a fun culture. I mean, they pretty much documented our entire junior and senior year of high school. So uh, the seniors that graduated in 2022 and the seniors that graduated in 2023 are now finally going to, or not now, are going to uh, like forever have a piece of what our team was. Like they have it all on document, they have it all on video, which is super cool. Like, I mean, I even go back and watch some of the video from like 2022 because those were my best friends that um, at the time that had graduated. So like those were the guys that I grew up playing with. Those are the guys that I played with until I was 13 and went to go play um, travel ball outside of Franklin. So like it's really nice to still have those memories, not just, you know, in your brain, but also like seeing us on the field together. It's super cool. Um, think, and then like on the, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, I think that's one of the coolest things about like this generation is that so much is documented and that there there's negatives to that as well, but you can go back and look at like some of your favorite moments, be like, just go back and watch it anytime. Was, it's it's exactly, fantastic. That's literally exactly what I was getting ready to go into is like, it's yes, there are definitely negatives to it. And you know, like, the negatives do come with it as people have seen like they understand it right like it's part of it um but like on the flip side of that like it's so cool to go back and watch you know your last high school game your first playoff high school game like there are videos of me pitching there like it's super cool to, for me to just kind of go back and watch them um as well as see all my friends play because a lot of them now are playing um are at the uh, collegiate level so like seeing us when we were younger and now seeing all of us do pretty big things is super cool oh uh, you brought up pitching there did you pitch at all in high school I did uh, all the way, fre or well, I guess I didn't have a freshman year because of COVID, but sophomore, junior, and then a little bit of my senior year, I did, yeah. Do you, do you miss it at all? I do. Um, it was super fun. I always enjoyed pitching because it was like you were on an island just competing. It was the same kind of adrenaline that you get like when you're in the box at a big spot, but it was just like that every single time on the mound. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm, I'm always interested in asking that because it's, you know, people kind of overlook that. Like all throughout high school, these guys, like you're a, basically a two-way player, right? And then it's at some points kind of just yeah, – it's just decided. I talked about this with Jackson Joe, where, uh, you know, he was a really good like just hitter uh, as well. Yeah. And so it's kind of tough for that decision to get made at such a young age. But like, yeah, you're doing you're doing this. What the uh, the following that you had garnered already? Did that with so many eyeballs already on you? Did that make the the draft process a little bit easier, knowing that you'd kind of experienced that whirlwind to a certain extent on social media? 
Absolutely. And like, not just with the draft, but with the college process and the uh, like ranking process, all of it, like social media, when I was way younger, like 15 and or like 14 and 15, when I had a little bit of traction, but not a ton. And like comparing that to how it is now, it's so much easier for me to handle. Like, I don't read my own press. I don't read like anything else that some people may say, like, I, I've stopped diving into that, or at least like believing in it. Like, I see stuff on Twitter all the time, like, especially right now, like it's, it's funny to me, you know what I mean? Like, um, and that's just stuff that I will continue to have my entire life. Like every single player has something like that. Um, so going through that process with social media, you know, in the background of it was, was helpful for me because I just like, I didn't read anything. I didn't buy into it. Like I just did my thing and social media was still there at the end of the day. So, you know, like a lot of the things with, the draft, especially like guys are tweeting who's going where guys are tweeting, like, you know, inside the war room, like what's going on. And it's just like me and my agent are talking and it's like, they're so far off. Like, it's just not what's happening. Um, so like being able to separate that into reality was big for me. And it, it, I was blessed to like learn that at a young age. Cause I had a following at a young age. That's a good point that you bring up. Cause especially like when you're on the inside, the way that you are so much information that you're fed on social media is wrong. <laughs> so it's like, oh, you, yeah. you, you, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced with baseball. Like I experienced it with barstool stuff where it's like, people will have a yeah. take on something. It's like, dude, that's not even like remotely close to the truth at all. And you just get, it's tough to swallow. Cause you, you wait for the truth to come out. I feel like, especially with the draft, when there's so many like smoke screens, you never know exactly who's telling the truth and who's lying might've made the process a little bit difficult. Let's, let's jump ahead to draft night. You know, it was, I, you know, there was, again, there were a lot of, a lot of different things. I did see projections. Pretty much all of them had you top five. Pirates picking number one overall. I, I figured you'd fall somewhere in that in that th you know three to five range. Uh, were you surprised on the night that it was the Tigers? You know, this is a funny story I've told a couple of times. And to be quite frank, I actually was because um, we had been pretty much like told by someone else that like I was it was happening here this amount like that was it. Um, and it was after who I got drafted by. But um, anyways, like. Detroit and I had been relatively distant like after the end of April because um, they were really, really heavy hitters at the beginning of my high school season. Um, and then like, I mean, I played great. So it was like 50-50 uh, whether they were either like, okay, this is our guy or okay, not our guy. Because they just like didn't, they weren't there at the end of a high school season or at least to our knowledge. Like they literally just stopped um, like showing up. Um, and then the night before the draft, I actually had a great call with Scott and, you know, we discussed a bunch of stuff and then I was like, oh, wait a second. So they might be in. Um, so like, I was completely like, I had no lead coming into the draft night. Cause I, like you said, I heard smoke screens at one, I heard smoke screens at two. And so already you're like, well, I guess it is a possibility. Right. So like you're, you're already thinking about, it. um, and then I had new information that three was in when we all thought we were, they were out. And then I knew I was going at the next two spots. So you know, trying to figure that out and understand it all was definitely like, that's what made it hectic. But I mean, it was all done in 15 minutes. That's what was crazy. You know, the one thing I've heard about this uh, current Tigers administration with Scott Harris is that they're very, you know, they keep things very close to the chest in terms of the information that they, that they give out. So I guess I'm not shocked by how kind of, you know, that, that you're in the dark to a certain extent yeah. uh, the, the night before the draft. I mean, did that, did that add to the stress or was the hard part over at that point? Knowing like, look, I'm going to get drafted. It's going to be okay. That, that is, I was just blessed to be in the position where I knew I was going to go in a good spot that was going to make my family comfortable, make me comfortable, make my friends and everybody else happy and make, you know, just my first dream of ever being a baseball player to make that professional debut. So um, I was, I was totally happy. Like it didn't even matter at that point, but I was definitely excited to get drafted by Detroit because it's close to home great fan base, um, really, really good development with what I'm experiencing right now. So, you know, I'm really enjoying it here and I'm super happy. So like it worked out definitely for the best. Who was the first tiger that reached out to you? Hmm. That's a good question. Actually. Oh, it was uh, Dylan Dingler. So we have the same agent. Um, okay. so yeah, Dingler and I share an agent. So he actually reached out to me, congrats. And, uh, we had actually met two years prior. So it was like super small world. Um, and so, yeah, he was super excited and I was too. It was like, and it was nice to have somebody, um, super close. And then right after that was McGonagall. So like Dingler texted me right after I got drafted, congrats. And then McGonagall actually ended up calling me that night when he got selected. Cause so since him and I played on U uh, U18 together, we had been friends for a couple of years prior as well. So like we were super stoked. We were loving it on the phone and, you know, it made us, made us really cool that we were going to play together. 
Yeah, I'm going to try to get him on the show here at, at some point. It seems like his stock oh, is love it. People are really happy with that pick. Yeah. Oh, my God. He's just going crazy. Like, he he was the most underrated player in our class by far. Like, he was a top five player. I don't care what anybody says. Wow. He, he might have been the best hitter, honestly. Like, it was just – it's unreal how how good that kid is. We'll have to we'll have to reach out to him then. You know, I, I watched uh, a, a YouTube video with you where you talked about, you know, how, how much tech – has kind of helped your game and, and that you, you, know, yeah. you, you talk about yourself as a, as a huge tech guy. And that's so, it's so interesting to me because, you know, you're so young. And I think that you brought up that the, the, the t- type of tech that you were looking at was something that was implemented in 2018. So we're talking when you were like 13 years old, do you feel like you're kind of ahead of the curve to a certain, ahead of the curve to a certain extent in terms of your knowledge of, of tech and analytics relative to maybe some other people in the minor leagues? I, I absolutely do. Like I always preach that. Um, and it's not just like it's tech, but it's also like my body awareness, like all of these things that, you know, you typically learn in college. Like I was blessed to have a facility that had access to all of these, not just items, but also people. Um, and, you know, being e- in there each and every day for four years straight, you learn a lot that, you know, most guys may not be blessed to have a facility that is as, you know, impactful as mine. Or they might just not have the resources to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, they're all great players. But it's like, when you're with that every single day, you learn and you learn. Um, you learn how to use the tech. You learn what it's for. You, 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 you know, like, it's just, it's so many different things that you are able to take away from, like, every single day that you train. Um, that, like, over time, it just builds so much more knowledge. Um, and, like, being a high school guy, that's big because you're missing a huge piece of development going to college. It's a good point. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. And I love that answer because I've talked to basically every tiger person I've talked to so far in doing this show has talked about, you know, the, the influence and the influx of analytics and, and video stuff and, and tech throughout the organization. I feel like it's, it's a huge step that if it, if it was there in previous administrations, it might not be, might not have been as, as, as influential as it is now. And it's like the words like that, like tech and analytics, like there, there's a, not stigma behind it, but all it is, is just a- access to greater information. Like it's I, to me, if, I, if I'm a player, why would I say no to that? It's like anything that could potentially improve your game. Uh, it's just, it's unique that, you know, there's, it's being, you know, uh, brought on the younger generation. I think that's fantastic. And I think that's going to lead to fewer injuries too. Like hopefully in terms of just the way these guys take care of their bodies. Um, now the no, time I think that's, I think I, before we go, like, I think oh, what right. you just said is huge. Like not just injuries, like, just the ability to take the info. And even if some of it you don't agree with, you don't need, whatever it may be, having access to that is just such a next level of where we were, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago in the game of baseball as a whole. Like you have every single pitch the guy throws, the percentage he throws it, the location he throws it the most, you know, what he goes to with runners in scoring position. And on the flip side, like batters hot and cold zones, like, but to the just smallest decimal point, like, the the way the game is changing and you know some people don't like it because it's going analytics driven mm-hmm. there's still a lot of good in that like there is so much like at the end of the day you have to go and play baseball but you know every chance you can to make the game easier is going to help you because this game is so so damn hard right. so taking everything you can to the day you know day in day out in the cage the field the game whatever it may be to like build your advantage is going to make you better in the long run you uh w- this question that i'm about to ask is going to make me feel old here but the last time the tigers made the playoffs max you were you were nine years old um do you have many memories of watching some of those tigers teams growing up or was it a little bit before your time so i would say i would say yes because uh, my brother and i actually grew up playing mlb 2k10 we used to play okay. each other all the time on the week um and so at the time like this was was like they were they were cooking in the, in the tent mm-hmm. so it was like Watching Cabrera is my one memory because that was like prime, prime, prime and like continuing for the next few years. Like that was just as good as it got. Um, so I used to literally always play as him and like we and we, I would just kill my brother. So, you know, obviously, like I don't have a sports team where I'm from. So we all just like watch the surrounding teams um, and Detroit was one of them. So like it was that's why it was like super cool to get drafted here because I, I mean, I played as the Tigers at one point. Like I played in Little League as the Tigers at one point. So like it was super cool. Uh, you know, full circle, but it's like definitely memories of watching Cabrera just obliterate baseballs all over the yard. He was our, yeah, he was our guy for so long. And he was the one player that like transcended the team that he played for where like I would have uh, opposing fans who would go to Comerica and be like, dude, I'm, 
I'm here to watch Miggy. Like, I know he kills yeah. us, but just like he, he had such an art form to his at bats were such an art form in, in themselves that people would watch and just learn. I mean, I can't even, I was talking to, uh, to Casey Mize about it earlier this week where he's like, I, I down in summer camp, like I, uh, during the COVID year, like I had to face him a bunch and it was like, I had fun doing that. Like even, even at the yeah. age, that he was at. um, really like I had fun when I went up to America and just like had a conversation with him. I thought it was the coolest thing ever that he even knew who I was. And it was mm-hmm. like, his sons had been following me for a while. So like that in a whole was like just completely mind blowing. He's from what I've heard, he was really good throughout this whole process to the young guys. And Mize, Mize told me, he said, I struck Miggy out when I faced him. And his conspiracy is that Miggy struck out on purpose because he wanted Mize to make the team in summer camp. (laughs) I think it's fantastic if that's the case. Um, You know, you, as you kind of come up and, and people talk about you as a prospect, especially in the draft, uh, you know, these buzzwords get thrown around like campness, generational, you know, five tool player, what have you. When you are competing and when you're coming up through the, the draft process and now that you're in the minor leagues, do you view yourself as a generational talent or is it more of just like trying to get better on a day to day basis? Definitely just trying to get better and better each and every day. Like it's it is so draining to get caught up in that kind of stuff and like have the prospect fatigue and all of this above. Like it is so easy to just derail your mental state by reading into stuff on Twitter. Like I got in at that a little bit last year when I was scuffling in low A and it actually wasn't just like social media. It was like just the fact that I wasn't playing good Mm -hmm. and I just completely lost like my confidence. Like Mm -hmm. you have to have your confidence and be you each and every day. But like on the flip side of that, you also can't buy into anything anybody else says. It's about being you, doing your process each and every day and trusting those around you to make you better. Like it's a it's a real, real effort to like commit to just being you every single day. And when you do that, you know, multiple days in a row, multiple months in a row, that's when you start seeing guys rise and rise and rise. And then eventually they, they debut. And I'm sure like nobody really cared if Mike Trout was a generational FCL prospect, they cared if he was a generational big leaguer, which he is. Right. And same thing with Riley green, like every, like he was the guy out of high school and he, and he heard it and he heard it and he heard it. And now he is like, that's, I, I can guarantee you Riley wasn't sitting on Twitter each and every day. Like I'm the guy, I'm the guy, I'm the guy reading it. And then he has a bad game. I'm not the guy. I'm not the guy. Like you can't buy into that. You just have to be you each and every day. It's especially when you're drafted that high, you know, and baseball is so much different than any other sport where like it's going to take, you know, it's going to take multiple years just to kind of get, the, you know, come up through the system. And Green, I think, is a prime example because Green didn't hit his first his first year in the minor leagues. I mean, it's a small sample size. He played like 30 something games and you already had people, you know, concerned about it. I'm sure it it, it gets into your head at, at, a, at a certain uh, point. You know, you've, uh, you know, I've watched a lot of videos with you, you know, you're, you, you're big on the fit. You're big on the swag. You're big on, you know, you're making sure you look good for your, your game, the game day drip as the kids, so to speak, I guess from a confidence standpoint to you, how important is, is the fit? Like, does, do you feel like that impacts or helps your confidence as a player? Absolutely does. It's so funny. You bring this up. Cause I was just talking to some of our office guys about this. Like I, tried to like do the thing where you just put your head down because you're a rookie and like work your tail off and all that stuff. And like, that's great. Like there's nothing wrong with that. I still do that. But it's like, I started being someone that I wasn't like, I'm always going to have passion and flair and like drip and all this stuff. Like it's, it's always going to be there. And it was like, when I started taking that away, I stopped being myself. So when I stopped being myself, I stopped playing as well. And then it just like spiraled. I was mentally chalked. I wasn't playing well. Like, yeah, like, I know it was a small sample size, but like, I still, I played so bad in low A. It was just the worst, you know, however many weeks down there. Um, But it was like, when I kind of just gave up on it and was like, you know what, I'm just gonna be myself, be a dog, be a competitor each and every day. I led the postseason in hits. So it was like, I found myself again, I guess you could say, like it was a new, new found Max Clark, right? Like, but it was in reality, it was just who I was prior. And I was just like being confident in myself each and every day. And I think that's you're going to benefit a lot from the fact that AJ Hinch is the manager here because he's been open about like I want my players to express themselves the way that they feel necessary. Which I mean, we've seen instances even recently in Major League Baseball where that isn't the case, where uh, there's kind of this one size fits all approach. And I I, like it's a tough thing to explain to people that might not get it, but man, I've seen it impact 
player's confidence. There's a reason why guys will change teams and they immediately get better sometimes. Like sometimes the environment sure. is is every bit as important as the player uh, themselves. Uh, sure. you, had a, you had a great quote uh, that kind of that kind of leads into my next question where, where you said, you know, I play the game with passion and flair, which some people don't like because they think it's arrogant. I guess for you, especially a guy who's who's so young right now, how do you find that balance between passion and arrogance? I think like the easiest way for me to explain it is passion is somebody who loves the game and arrogance is just somebody who's really damn good. Like if you look at a guy who's just really good, but he's just like all about not just himself, but like his play versus a guy who's passionate and like has his emotions around his game, but positive and negative, he's still bringing emotion. You're only going to see arrogant guys like that when they're playing well, when they're, you know, the top dog on the team, whatever it may be. But it's like the passion guys, they bring it every day, no matter how bad they're playing, no matter how rough it's been, like no matter who, where they are, like if they're not happy with their situation, like guys who love the game will always love the game. That's a great answer. And I think a guy in Major League Baseball that, that fits that mold is Bryce Harper, where for a long time, Harper was viewed as like, oh, he's cocky, he's arrogant. But I feel like especially a lot of it was overblown. But once he got to Philly and he's like, oh, wait, you want me to play first base? Yeah, I'll do it. Like, you want me to play with a torn UCL? Yeah, I'll do it. Like, that's a guy. And now he's like one of the most beloved players in the, in the league because people are like, man, this guy just loves the sport of baseball. He's just a student of the sport of baseball. You know, so much has happened to you so fast throughout this process, even, you know, whether it's the growth on social media, you're getting drafted in the top five. You know, do you ever feel any, you know, sense where you were getting overwhelmed by the entire process or do you kind of keep your feet on the ground throughout the whole thing? To be honest, I was lucky enough to kind of have my feet on the ground during the whole thing. Um, I think mostly because it was super fun. Like all of it was just action packed. It was fun. I mean, it was draft, SBs, report for date, uh, play your first pro game. Like it was just so fast and all of it was super positive that I didn't really get caught up in it. Um, you know, like if things may have gone south at a certain point, you know, that may not have been the case, but I was lucky enough to where it was just, it was super fun every day. It was new experiences every day. And like, that's, that's kind of who I am. Like, I love, I love experiencing new things. Like I'm the guy who will try whatever you want me to eat, like that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, moving forward and just kind of keeping it going throughout the entire summer was a blast to me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, outside of Miggy, who's the most, uh, Who's the person that you've met that you were maybe not starstruck by, but you kind of said to yourself, oh, I can't believe I'm, I'm running into this person right now. Uh, it was, it was hundred percent Riley. And I know that's kind of seems like a, like a crazy answer, but it's like, I mean, I worked out with him while he was rehabbing cause I was down here early and it, we were the only two outfielders down here. So it's like, he had me trying new things. He had me trying these like glasses that would flash black lights. So like every time they hit your ground ball, it would like flash black. So you're trying to just like, pick up the ball in the seconds that you can. And he was just like all these different drills that he's been doing, you know, day in and day out to get back to where he needs to be. Like he was just bringing me along, being super helpful, um, super positive. And he's also like, he's, he might be the happiest person I've ever seen. Like he's just always smiling. He's always having fun. Um, and he's always like joking around with people too. So, you know, it was a super good environment for, you know, the four or five weeks that I was down here uh, by myself. And it was, it was really good. It was, it was awesome. What one of the main things I've gathered both doing this show and, and even before that is it seems like there's a really good sense of community all throughout the organization right now. Like it seems like for sure, you know, like Fork and Green, like they live together, they're good friends with each other. Like the pitching staff is is really close to each other. Not to say that that wasn't the case in the past, but I feel like like that Scott Harris like, strikes me as a big morale guy, and like that the makeup of a player and how these guys get along is you know, an important part of the organization. So that's, that's great to hear. Now, when you played in, in, in low way last year, uh, you, did you play with the new rules? I did. Yeah, I did. Was that the first time that you had done that? Yes. Was that, was there an adjustment period for you there? Honestly, I feel like the only, the only issue for me was the pitch clock. Um, and I actually like the pitch clock, to be honest. Um, like, I feel like it keeps a pace. Um, as long as you like, you can, you can control your own personal clock and like control and slow down the game. Um, I actually love the pitch clock. So I remember my first at bat in low, I actually got it like a strike because of a violation. So like it was, uh, it was definitely like a, an adjustment period because in low a, I think it's like, I think it's eight or not eight, uh, low a I, in FCL, they have like a 20 second, like very light clock where they're basically just like, dude, get in the box or like, Hey, pay attention. But in, in low a, obviously it's like actually enforced. So 
I think it was, uh, I was coming up to bat. Kevin had gotten a walk or something. And so I thought it was 18 seconds because it was, um, there was a runner on, but it was like, it was still 14 seconds. And I was like, oh no. And I could like see the clock walking down. And I was like, I'm still not going to make it in time. So um, that was probably the biggest adjustment, but everything else is super nice. Like the disengagement rule, it's so much easier to steal bags now, in my opinion, especially like with, especially with a guy with like plus speed, like it made it a lot easier because you could get a little more predictable with what a pitcher's going to do. Um, and pitchers also repeat it a little bit more. So like if they're stepping off twice and every single time they're going home, you have analytics for that. Like you're going to find other tendencies just because of a disengagement rule. So it made taking a couple bags a little easier. Um, and then bigger bases too. So, you know, bang, bang plays are a little bit bigger. You can get there a little bit quicker. One of my theories as to why you went three, as opposed to maybe dropping to four or five was, I think the new rules benefit a player like you. I mean, you have great speed. You can swipe bags. I mean, what you can do in the outfield, obviously that, that would have, that would have mattered even w- without the new rules. But I think, do you feel as though you're a player who will benefit potentially from those changes? Absolutely. I mean, I've noticed it in like spring training inner squad games that I've played. Like um, we're actually, we're working on some stuff with a couple of new steel leads and having that plus the disengagement rules. I mean, I swiped two bags just off the disengagement rules yesterday or two days ago. Sorry. So I was like, I could already tell like, this is going to be something that I can implement throughout the entire season, no matter the level. Um, and then in the automatic ball strike is also sick because plate like being a plus plate uh, discipline guy, like drawing a lot of locks. I mean, I really understand the zone. Um, and with the challenge system, like I, I got a couple, right. That I ended up getting a free base off of. So that's going to be, that's going to be huge too. That's, and I'm, we're not there yet, but I I'm at some point in the near future, we're going to get to that in the big leagues. And I'm, I'm, oh. for it. Like, I, I've been for it for a while, but like, I see so many at bats change off of, you know, strike that's called a ball ball that's called a strike and i think it'll be interesting to see because players take such pride in having a knowledge of the strike zone it'll be interesting to see how many players just will know right away dude challenge yeah let's do it like that that i think i think the challenge system will be the best thing to happen to baseball like i think the uh straight up robot zone where it's just abs i think that is garbage but i think the actual challenge system where there's still not only is there human element, but there's also strategy to that because you only get three per game. Like, I think that opens up the game for a lot more strategy. I think it makes the game, like, more fun, in my opinion. Um, and there's also, like, a pretty cool feeling when you get what right, get the base, and everybody's just stoked. Like, it's super cool. Yeah, I don't know if if you've ever watched tennis, but tennis is a very similar yeah, system, yeah, yeah, yeah. system with that where, like, they'll follow the ball. Uh, uh, Hawkeye, I think, is the name of it. And it's like the crowd gets mm-hmm. into it waiting for it. I, to me, that's, like, the best replay system in sports, so you, you get three a game. Do you get it back if you get it right? Yes. So it doesn't count if you get it right. You still have three. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. No, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I know they've been testing it out in the minor leagues. And I think that, you know, somebody like you, again, will, will benefit from the fact that you'll, have, you'll have gone through, you know, that process uh, before getting to the big league level. I read a, an article a few days ago that you had done something of a swing change over the last, uh, you know, coming into this year. I guess if you could just kind of talk about what led to that and what were the changes that you felt like have benefited you. Uh, I would say what led to it was honestly just I was getting a little deep in my path. Um, so like where I was set up, it was about right here. And so when I go back to swing, I'd create a lot of length like right in here. Uh, so like where I am now, I'm about right here. Uh, it's just, it's, there's way less action. There's way less wasted movement. Um, and that kind of translates to a, it definitely translates to a way cleaner path, but it's also like, I'm able to get the ball a little bit more out in front, which creates obviously more spin and more, or not, excuse me, not more spin, uh, more angle, more launch angle. So more law. Um, so like, it's been not only like a comfort and quickness change, but also a bit of a path change. So uh, power numbers have gone up my like all pretty much every number has gone up and then on top of that I added 15 pounds so um, those two combining like this swing really I'd say like it's where I should have been the whole time because um, it's where I feel the most comfortable um, and so now like I'm in a position where it's just like every swing I'm able to be impactful I'm able to drive it wherever um, I have more plate coverage so you know all positives was that an organizational decision or was that a personal decision you made on your own to to change things Combo of both, honestly. Um, like we were, but we were working together to find something that would translate to a better path. Um, and then we basically said, like, let's change the hand positioning. And then I kind of just picked like there, and I was like, it was perfect. And since then, we've had a little bit of tweak between like 
bad angle or like VBA um, stuff like that, which is vertical bad angle. Um, and it's basically just like the degree at which your bat is vertically placed at. And so, you know, they, they took the analytics and messed with that to create like a perfect 90 degree angle, which allows a way better path, et cetera. I like it. I like it. You know, you, you just, you brought up earlier that you, you had your struggles in low A, you know, and I, I was, I was curious about this because you went from being literally the top high school baseball player in the country. I mean, you're dominating the game to probably struggling more than you, you, you ever have. Did it become hard not to maybe panic in that situation that you were experiencing kind of the first struggles of your career? Uh, yeah, I mean, it did, honestly, like I was, like I said, I was kind of mentally torn up. Like I definitely think I could have gotten out of that slump a lot quicker than I did, but I couldn't because I was just completely mentally chopped. Like I started trying to a fight for hits. So like I was doing whatever I could to get hits instead of just hitting the ball hard. Um, and then it turned into like trying to do too much. And then it turned into, I need a swing change in the middle of the season, which is just like, that should never happen. Like you just kind of go in every single day and figure out what you can do to get the barrel to the ball. Like you can't change your swing just like in the middle of the season. Um, and then it was just like, I had a bad slump and then it just kept getting worse. Like if I would have just let it be bad and not pressed and made it turn to worse, it wouldn't have even been that bad. Like, I think at one point I was like one for nine, but mentally I was like, Oh, for 108. Like it was just, it was terrible. Um, and like, I just, I was, I changed the way I attacked the zone. I was super passive. Like I think my like zone contact rate was like 72%. And that's just, that's awful. Like that's really, really bad. So like, I mean, I was swinging through stuff that I shouldn't have been swinging through because I was trying too hard, all the above. So um, like, it was definitely a rough patch. Um, but then like when I got out of it in uh, the playoffs, it was like, okay, now we know, like, don't let your mental state really like just destroy, you know, one bad week and turn it into a bad month. Yeah. And I feel like, I mean, in a lot of ways, probably if you're going to get, have your struggles, like have them in low A, like learn, you know, you learn to fail first and then, and then, and then hopefully, you know, kind of ascend. Um, you know, I know you're from, in, you're, you're from Indiana. You, you said that you didn't have a particular team uh, growing up that you rooted for, but did you have any players that you kind of modeled your game off of or that you loved watching when you were younger? So honestly, growing up, my favorite player was Harper, um, like throughout the entire system. I love the way he played the game. And like there was a I know there's a famous quote out there where it's like we basically had to tell him to play less hard because he ran into the wall in like a spring training game um, and ended up getting hurt. And it was like, dude, you're a franchise guy. Like you can't play that hard, like in the middle of you know March or whatever. And he's like, no, I'm going to play the game the way it should be played hard every day. And, you know, that's who I've that's how I've stuck. Like, that's why I play the game so hard. Um, and like now it's kind of I'm turning some swing changes into you know, mirror kind of what he does because our lower half moves relatively similar. Obviously he's light years ahead of the consistency, but it's like, that's, we have some similar action there that I kind of want to repeat. Um, so, you know, he's been a guy that I've really stuck with since, um, since I was young. That's, you know, that's, that's a good guy to model your game after. I think that like, Riley to a certain extent is somewhat comparable in the way that he plays where right? AJ's talked about it. It's like, hey, man, I know, you know, I know he's diving for everything. Like I can't tell. Yeah. I can't tell our franchise guy like not to play with reckless abandon, but you do kind of have to have to hold your breath um, to a oh, certain. Absolutely. Extent. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, man, uh, I really appreciate you doing this, dude. And uh, look, I, I it's it sucks that it's been so long here in Detroit, but I promise you, I promise you, man, when when we're good, when we're really good, you have no clue how awesome this fan base is going to be like that place. is. Oh, I'm into that one. Amen to that, man. There was nothing better than going up to Comerica right after I got drafted. Like I saw it. I can already see what's happening with our team, our program, our culture. Like, and I'm a low way nobody right now. Like it is, it is unreal. Like the, everybody wants to win. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves the game. The clubhouse culture is incredible from the top to the bottom. So, you know, I'm more than excited and it's going to be, it's going to be a sweet process. Throughout the minor league, I've always been curious about this throughout the minor league season. How closely are you able to follow the major league team? Cause there's a lot of overlap. Oh, huge. League. Yeah. Huge. I, I follow them pretty much like last season. I was able to catch probably 40% of their games. Uh, like after the time I got drafted. So if not, like I'm a big, uh, I use like the MLB app all the time. So like I'll watch like the play by play when I'm going to a game or something like that. Um, just cause you know, I've connected with a lot of these guys now. So um, it's like, it's super cool to see them. You know, these are guys that I've met that I'm technically on the same team as like, 
it's it's really cool to see. Fantastic. Well, we're rooting for you, man. Hope to see you at Comerica Park real soon. Congratulations on everything. I mean, this is incredible you. what you've already built. And, uh, you know, easy guy to root for. We'll have you back on the show at some point here soon. Hope to get to see, yeah. you back. Hope to see you at Comerica at some point in the future. Max Clark, thanks for joining Chris and company. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you so much to Max Clark for joining the program. Uh, the word that comes to mind is maturity. I mean, 19 years old, just turned 19. Good Lord. I, I, we can dunk on the younger generation all we want, but I swear they're smarter than they've ever been. When me at 19, I don't know. Jeez. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to put, play in the big leagues, obviously, but just in terms of overall maturity, I mean, he's a just well-spoken guy. Really, I, maybe I'm just – I, lucky to be a Tiger fan because I swear every single one of these guys that I've talked to so far has been unbelievably impressive, both in terms of how they've handled themselves and just the over their overall like just ability to converse. Like I don't know, they're just good dudes. Uh, you know, easy organization to root for, which uh, maybe hasn't always been the case considering the lack of success over the last seven years or so. But uh, hopefully, guys like Max Clark can be part of the resurgence here. Really rooting for him. You know, look, I. I I remember the night of the pick, and there were people that were frustrated with the pick. I was surprised by the pick at the time, but um, look, we got to understand, you know, we kind of felt the same way when Riley Green was drafted. These guys are so young, and while I think a guy like Wyatt Langford will hit right away with the Rangers, you know, I think the ceiling for Max Clark as potentially a five-tool player is is pretty remarkable, you know, and given – just talking to him right now, like I'm, I'm willing to bet on the guy. He brought up, you know, modeling his game and loving Bryce Harper. Just watching him, you know, in the, in the highlights I've seen of him, get a little bit of Corbin Carroll vibes. And if anybody watched Corbin Carroll last year, he had a transcendent rookie season. Like if he can have that kind of impact on the Tigers, we could be looking back at this pick several years from now as potentially a steal, which is, I mean, rare to say when you're talking about the number three pick in the draft. But I think his ceiling is that high. Really rooting for him. Thank you to him for joining the program. That will do it for today's episode. You can follow me on Twitter at Castellani2014. Hit that like button, that subscribe button. If you're watching this on Rumble or YouTube, comment. Let me know who you want me to interview next. Link tree is in the description for this. If you want to listen to this in audio form on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, all that stuff is available for you. We're like, I'm going to have to slow down a little bit because we're pretty backlogged in terms of our um, our, our episodes. I felt bad for Max because he, you know, he took his time out to do the interview and I'd be like, yeah, this will be out in this will be out in two weeks. Like that's, I don't know. I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep the kid waiting. He was, he was nice enough to do the show, but uh, right now there's a few people that are uh, in, in the queue. And by the time this episode is uploaded, we may have already interviewed them, but uh, Max or Max. <laughs> oh boy. Nick Stauskas, Michigan legend has agreed to do an episode of Chris and company. He may be next in line, uh, trying to lock down Will Compton as well. Some other uh, barstool personalities. So uh, stay tuned. I'll tweet all that stuff out, you know, the programming notes, what have you for the time being. Thank you for your continual support it means a lot to me. Let's continue to get these watch hours up. I'm hungry as fuck right now. Pardon my French, but uh, I'm really proud of what we're doing here. And I think it's going to continue to grow. So thank you guys so much for uh, joining the program, continuing to listen. I will see y'all for the next episode. Peace and happiness. Go get them, tiger.